Before we talk, talk about the spirit in the early fathers, we should note a caution which it attaches to John's teaching on the direct guidance of the spirit because this text is much abused today. Sweet comments on 1 John 4, 1 to 6, which says, Try the spirits, hereby know ye the spirit of God. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. Sweet says this, A secondary test is to be found in readiness to accept the testimony of the authorized teachers of the truth. No man who was taught by the Spirit of Christ would reject the witness of his duly accredited messengers. The true prophet is distinguished by his acknowledgement of the person of Jesus Christ and his acceptance of the accredited teachers of the church. So Sweet is throwing this in over a century ago to check the tendency that he was already seeing in some churches in Protestantism to reject the teaching of the teachers in favor of personal spirit guidance. And of course, <laughs> Sweet couldn't have known the extent to which Pentecostalism would develop these ideas and uh, the cults as well would grab onto them as uh, as it were a modern version of Gnosticism, the direct guidance of God into the individual soul. Now the spirit in the early fathers, as the, as the New Testament period comes to a close, we observe in the case of the Gospel of John a new clarity regarding the office and importance of the spirit. On the other hand, a diminution of interest of the subject in the subject in the view of pressing practical problems which would come up in the uh, period after the apostles died, out, died away. In the worship and life of the church, of course, the Spirit continues to play a significant role, but on the intellectual front, the claims of Christ become even more important than, than they had been in the earliest days of the church. For instance, in the epistle to the Hebrews, there are but seven references to the Spirit. That will not surprise us when we consider that the epistle has almost a singular ap apologetic focus, and that is but one aspect of the significance of Christ, his heavenly priesthood. The seven mentions of the Spirit in Hebrews assume a different importance when we note that there is but a single reference to even the resurrection in Hebrews. For no doubt similar apologetic reasons, the Spirit is comparatively insignificant in the book of Revelation. But we know that this book's purpose is the revelation of Jesus Christ according to its very first verse. Now Sweet gives an apt summary of the next three generations after the Apostles, the writers we call the Apostolic Fathers and the Apologists. Quote, The post-apostolic church followed apostolic precedent in associating the Holy Spirit with the Father and the Son. From the end of the second century, Christian writers began to speak of a Trinity, trias or trinitas in Latin. Early baptismal creeds professed faith in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and early doxologies and hymns glorified the Spirit with the Father and the Son. It was seen that the Spirit belonged to the sphere of the divine, insofar that he could be the object of faith and adoration. Yet no one, no early creed called him God and no Christian writer before the third century, with one partial exception, sought to investigate the relation of the Spirit to the Father and the Son. It was understood that he is third in the order of the Trinity, and in some undefined way, subordinate to the Son, who is second. Some writers of the second century manifest a tendency to confuse the Spirit with the Son. And on the whole, his place in the divine life was so little emphasized that Catholic Christians were attacked by the earlier monarchians as ditheists and not as tritheists. That's all a quote from Sweet himself. As examples of this confusion, or at least the lack of precision in Christian thinkers of the period, we might cite the Shepherd of Hermas, who identifies the Son with the Spirit, Justin Martyr, who seems to identify the Spirit with the Logos, and Irenaeus, who more helpfully left us the illustration of the Son and Spirit as two hands of God. Origen regards the Spirit as personal, but regards him as a creation of the Son. 
though separated from all other creatures by an infinite distance that in effect makes him divine as well. James Orr, in his great book Progress of Dogma, explains this imprecision of doctrine. Quote, the earliest age of the church shows little trace of reflection on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. From the first, the church acknowledged that the threefold name, name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and so implicitly might be said to have confessed the deity and personality of the Spirit. But there was no dogmatic treatment of the subject. The church possessed the Spirit and did not feel the need of discussing it. That's the end of the or quote. Now the controversies of the fourth century. Although confusion over the Spirit's relation to God continued well past the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, the only early father who seems to have denied the personality of the Spirit was Lactantius, not a major figure in theological thought even then. Arius, on the other hand, held that the Holy Spirit was the first created being produced by the Son, an opinion very much in harmony with that of Origen. Athanasius asserted that the Holy Spirit was of the same essence with the Father, but the Nicene Creed contains only the indefinite statement, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Cappadocians followed in the footsteps of Athanasius and vigorously maintained the homoousis of the Holy Spirit. Hilary of Poitiers in the West held that the Holy Spirit, as searching the deep things of God, could not be foreign to the divine essence. Controversy raged on throughout the 4th century, but by the Council of Constantinople, 381 AD, the Catholic Church had reached the consensus on the essential divinity of the Holy Spirit. Two ideas were finally decisive in the Church's rejection of such aberrations as the Arian notion of the personal but created spirit. One was the previously cited principle based on 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Second, Scripture also is clear that the Spirit imparts eternal life to believers. Who can give us life, asked the 4th century fathers, but the one who has life in himself, God? And who can penetrate the inner thoughts of God, but God himself? Just as only the spirit of a man knows his inner thoughts, so too only the Spirit of God can know God and reveal him to his creatures. In the next segment, we'll talk about why the Holy Spirit is so shy. <laughs>